This is Defenders TV Podcast, episode 59, covering Daredevil, season 2, episode 5, Kinbaku. Welcome back, Defenders, to Defenders TV Podcast, episode 59. We're covering Daredevil, season 2, episode 5, Kinbaku. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. I'm one of your other Bound and Gags hosts, John. And I'm free as a daisy. I don't know about those two, but I'm fine. And I'm Chris. Welcome back, everybody. We've got all three of our hosts on the Whee! podcast. This is the first time since uh, Daredevil started, I believe, that we have all three of us at the same time on the podcast. Well, we had a transatlantic or trans-Siberian uh, host last time. So, yeah, but this time is all three of us in a room. <laughs> Absolutely. And that brings me on to my first correction of the podcast. Uh, John was in... Serbia, uh, which made some of our comments a little bit confusing on the last podcast, but uh, yeah, it wasn't freezing at all, were you? No, it was a nice 22 degrees in uh, Mediterranean um, style weather. Um, <laughs> it's a very different. Than enjoying what we some nice uh, Greek food and some nice wine in the evenings after work. Very nice. Some nachos? No, feta. Electro nachos? <laughs> no, uh, electro feta. Ah, okay, okay. Followed by a lovely uh, Serbian white wine. Very nice. Very tasty. Very nice. Very nice. Well, welcome back, listeners. Really good to have you back with us for our fifth episode of our Daredevil podcast. We just finished up our Agent Carter podcast for season two uh, just this week. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, uh, go download it over at DefendersTVPodcast.com. You can look for the iTunes link by going to DefendersTVPodcast.com slash iTunes. Or you can pick us up on any other good podcast catcher by looking for Defenders TV Podcast. Uh, if you subscribe on there, you'll get our episodes of Daredevil all of our episodes about Agent Carter uh, and all of our episodes about Jessica Jones and upcoming the Marvel movies that are coming up this year. So we'll have uh, Civil War coming up. We've had Fan Forstick, uh, I think, as it's, as it's known. Uh, we've had a, a number of other films covered <laughs> on that feed. But uh, go subscribe. And if you like the show, make sure you do leave us a review in iTunes, which will help other people pick up the podcast. Uh, on that note, we have had a couple of requests now that we're finished our Agent Carter coverage, uh, as we covered all of season one and season two now. And there is a possibility we won't see a season three. Uh, we've had a couple of questions about whether we will be increasing our output for Daredevil. Um, just wanted to address it here just so everybody is aware of, of what way we're covering it. Uh, we want to make sure that we have as many of the hosts available uh, when we do our podcasts, which can't always be uh, done as quickly as we'd like it to be. Um, what we're going to do is make sure that we have at least one podcast on Daredevil out every week uh, and hopefully with all three of our hosts uh, available for those podcasts uh, and hopefully for particularly for the big events like Civil War and for the first episodes of new shows like Luke Cage, all the way up to uh, Doctor Strange, we'll have at least three of our hosts here. Absolutely. In fact, there may be four. My astral plane self may also be here for the October podcast of Doctor Strange. You'll certainly probably be on a cloud. Absolutely. Speaking of which, there were some rather good um, photographs of Doctor Strange. of, And in particular... There was Doctor Strange buying Doctor Strange, which was quite nice, mm -hmm. um, in a comic book store <laughs> in New York, which um, for all those lucky, lucky people who were there, that must have been awesome. Yeah, very cool, right. actually. Yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch in his full Doctor Strange costume, standing in a store, uh, comic book shop particularly. Uh, really, really cool for everybody involved there. He was caped. He was capeless. He was with Mordo, uh, Baron Mordo. He wasn't with Baron Mordo. So all looking fab. And um, Scott Derrickson, who's directing as well, tweeted that it's a wrap. So all... Um, I suppose principal photography uh, it has been done now mm -hmm. on Doctor Strange the movie, so it's really into the editing suite, I suppose. Uh, maybe any other additional pickups that they need to do, and of course, hopefully, um, a few post-credit sequences of uh, Doctor Strange being introduced to the wider world after Civil War. Absolutely, uh, and Scott Derrickson, I feel your pain. I know how long editing takes, but I'm sure it's even worse for a multi-billion-dollar production like the Marvel Universe. <laughs> uh, Chris, what did you think of the photographs? I'm sorry, John. I'm on the fence. Not. I, I don't know why this is. I think it's the first time we're going to see doctor strange in the he, he's in full doctor strange garb so the cloak and the blue doublet which is the first time in the mcu that we're going to see someone not in 
normal, what we would consider civilian t-shirt jeans kind of wear. And I think that that's going to take some... Apart from Cap. Yeah, Captain America. Well, hold on. He was he was back even back in the nineteen forties in the original, the first Avenger film. It was mm-hmm. still nineteen forties wear. Whereas this is kind of like he's wearing his spectral costume. Yeah, but Vision. What about Vision? Vision was nude. <laughs> he was full on like just like Iron Man. He was. He wears his gear. No, I mean, I just Ant Man. I just mean like unless we see. Um, Doc, Doctor Strange, like Stephen Strange, in his like day to day in a suit type mm-hmm. thing, then it's gonna kind of take people a bit of getting used to, because they filming it in like six one six. So like, sorry, six one six um is kind of like the standard kind of universe, so, or so the MCU version, if you want, whatever the numbering is on that one, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Like so, you're gonna have people like we seen in that set photo that was released. There was there were cars behind them, but these guys are dressed in like almost like Asgardian kind of tunics and doublets. So it's just gonna be a bit of kind of we can't explain away. So they're gonna have to say like, oh well, this when he goes ma- all magic, he's gonna like suddenly just kind of the cloak billows out and all that. Kind yeah, of. I mean, the, there's a couple of things that definitely like. This could have heavy CGI following production uh, with them in that scene. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's devoid of the cinematography. So, like, I mean, to be honest, the colours do look a bit kind of... Not washed is not the right word, but, the, you know, they don't look as rich as probably they might do or uh, as um, darkened or whatever whatever style they're going for um, as they would do because the, obviously there's the, the cinematography um, isn't necessarily there. I mean, I would agree that hopefully we will see him as Dr. Stephen Strange, the, the, the surgeon, and that we see some element of that normality. Um, it could also be maybe he's on uh, the astral plane where he would just generally be in in blue and he does take on that blue appearance and um, and the only other thing i would say is that on that the cloak looked weird it looked too small but i think maybe there's going to be cgi cloak mm-hmm. added yeah. definitely like i mean yeah the the must be and so that's probably just for him to help him act in terms of maybe holding it if he needs to or swishing it or whatever it is <laughs> he needs swish, to his face. swish. Um, you know i mean he's in nepal we've seen those pictures of him in nepal where he's in regular clothes yes and um, so I mean, we will see that. Absolutely. But well, cool to get some set photos. Uh, Absolutely. Affi- officially released. No no production stills yet, I think, because that's the big difference that we're talking about here. Uh, no particular production stills, so nothing after the fact, because they're only going into editing, only just finished shooting. So uh, they have released some photographs, as you say, from the Nepal shoot, which was in October last year, I think. Uh, and these photos are from New York last week. Loads of photographs taken uh, through really crappy phone cameras that have been released over time. But these are the first really high quality pictures of him in what looks very like the costume version of Doctor Strange, showing that they're not shying away from at least trying to do the real co- real comic book costume version of Doctor Strange, which is nice. So I do take your point, Chris, that in a lot of the Marvel uh, movies, we've seen movie versions of the outfits, I suppose, uh, a lot more than than um, probably some of the other older films or older versions of the comic book movies. Uh, it really is a good testament to the production that they're really trying to show Doctor Strange as Doctor Strange, not trying to have him in street clothes doing magic, showing that he is po- going to be wearing the the traditional costume. Well, I think, yeah, and I think definitely either they would have gone for totally new look, I mean, with elements or themes from that traditional costume, or they've kind of got to go with the the costume. But don't forget, we're going to have Black Panther. I mean, there's a guy in a black leotard, essentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Um, and he looks cool, though, in Civil War. <laughs> he does, he does, exactly. But that is final Absolutely. trailer quality um visuals Mm -hmm. absolutely yep totally agree uh that's the doctor strange coverage for this week we will be covering more doctor strange as we lead up to october 28th i'm sure um, because we will talk about it every i'm sure when the trailer hits um there will be a 15 hour podcast a special (laughs) podcast for that one just for john (laughs) me myself and derek won't even be on the podcast it will just be john talking for 15 hours 
Well, I might do the intro and then say, John, what do you think? <laughs> Welcome to John's monologue. <laughs> <laughs> that and for Iron Fist as well. Oh, all three of us will be here for Iron yeah, Fist no, without a doubt. No, absolutely, but I will still have my 15-hour monologue. That's very true. That's very true. But speaking of Iron Fists, I think on to Kim Baku. Yep, it is about that time to get into our episode of Daredevil. So this is Season 2, Episode 5, Kim Baku, uh, directed by Flora Sigismondi. I get all the best names to mess up. Sorry about that. Uh, Floria is well known for directing tons of videos for very very cool uh music videos in the past um one of her biggest ones was marilyn manson's beautiful people um which yeah, cool yeah really really classic video you'll definitely remember it if you saw it and that style has been used many many times after the fact uh, she also directed the excellent movie actually the runaways uh, starring Kristen stewart and dakota fanning uh, it was kind of the story of joan jett uh, and the the band the runaways so a really good really good movie there really good uh uh, passed to the director of this episode. And the episode was written by Lauren Schmidt Hisrich, uh, who is, came from a past working on the West Wing. So passed with some cool political intrigue and political drama, uh, at this time turning her hands to the little Hell's Kitchen, uh, brigade. Uh, John, do you want to tell us what she gave us in this episode? Sure. A former lover, Electra Natchez, arrives in Hell's Kitchen to ask for Matt Murdock's help with her father's business dealings with the company Roxon Energy Corporation. However, her appearance turns his world upside down as it reignites the painful past of his father's murder and his history with Electra. Matt refuses to help her, though he spies on her business dealings, and instead looks forward to his blossoming romance with Karen Page. As Karen and Matt head out on their first date, Karen keeps her continued pursuit of the truth about the Punisher and his past from him. However, after the meal, Murdoch is drawn back to Electra's apartment and is reminded by her of his potential for darkness at the home of Roscoe Sweeney, the killer of Jack Murdoch. But just as he is about to leave, unexpected guests converge on Nacho's penthouse and she tells him to prepare to fight. So lots of flashbacks in this episode. Mm. A big, a big uh, return to young, young Matt and uh, his wonderful haircut and his great square glasses. Uh, loved it, really good. If you're joining us for our for the first time for this episode of Daredevil, just to let you know, the way we cover our episodes is we discuss our top five points, some good, some bad about the episode uh, between each each of the three of us, and hopefully through covering those five points, we'll cover the full episode, uh, and then we tell you whether we defend it or not. Yeah, those square glasses really reminded me of the artwork from uh, Daredevil Yellow, actually, uh, the the Loeb uh, book mm -hmm. uh, and series of comics, comic issues that were pulled together. I think you have Hulk Grey and um, I think there's a few others as well, but like Daredevil Yellow really... Those square glasses really reminded me of, of that series of comics, uh, which was really cool. I love the way they kind of de-aged him. I presume it was lots of foundation and a wig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, love the glasses. Love the love the the way it really shows you immediately every time you go to Matt Murdock um, that it is right in the past. You can tell very quickly that you're that you're back with young Matt Murdock. Well, he's uh, clean shaven in every one of the flashbacks. It's like he hit thirty and then suddenly went nope. I forgot to shave every day. That's it. I've done it for my 20s. That's the only way I knew. Because there was one second I was like, oh, like the swept off hair. Okay, yes, he had. The wig was somewhat sometimes shifting, especially in the in, um the, the love scene. Well, I'm not calling it that. <laughs> Fogwell's. Kim Baku. <laughs> in the Fogwell's gym scene. Because mm -hmm. that is not a love okay. scene. And we'll get to that briefly later. We will. But do you want to kick us off with your first point, Chris? Okay. Well, look. Let's not beat around the bush. Let's just jump into Electra. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is our official introduction to our Daredevil kind of verse. I don't know how to kind of think. So we obviously did go, get briefly the mention of in season one, where he was the Matt's Greek girlfriend was back mm -hmm. in the flashback. So like we knew it was coming, and I'm glad they waited until now. Yeah, um, yeah, me too. It's I I enjoyed the. Like, I really enjoyed the flashback that kind of set it up. Aside from some of the, the wig falling and the, okay, I, I knew it wasn't their fault. It was a fight scene when they were in the gym. But anyway, I'm, I'm going astray. The, the narrative of Electra leading Matt astray and him liking it was really, really, really sold well. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And right until the point where you obviously, he, he, they're in the mansion and then you actually understand 
kind of why he didn't want to. Like, Electra's offering, like, Matt, his father's murder to execute. And it drives home how twisted her ethics are. And it's clear that, like, we see the formulation of Matt's kind of moral judgment. Like, and how he's kind of, like, that up until that point, he was probably on the fence. And then at that point, it kind of crystallizes. It was good. I like this as an origin to their relationship. It's a bit different from the comics. Because, um, mm-hmm. like, Electra was, she was appeared in Daredevil 168, um, which was 1981, and that was back in the Frank Miller era. And mm-hmm. they, they, they were somewhat faithful. Like, that joyride in the red sports car, that's yeah. directly out of uh, The Man Without I Fear, who kind of run mm-hmm. with uh, yeah. Frank Miller and John Romita Jr. Mm-hmm. Um, and we mentioned it previously, actually, last season, because this is where... Matt got it. Well, this was where the comics introduced Matt's uh, black, the man in black kind of uh, proto DD suit. But it was good. I re I like. I liked the her introduction. Like they could have taken this many ways. I think what it comes down to is actually Elodie Young. She really yeah. sells Electra as this complex, inscrutable, seductive kind of presence. Yeah. Um, you can classy psychopath. I had down. Um... Exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, She's like she is like a, the Black Widow. She's seductive. She draws you in, but then underneath that, she's kind of got her dark side. Definitely. Cer- yeah. Certainly. And, and yeah, I like that touch, and I like the connections with Frank, with the Frank Miller version of of Electra. Uh, I, I love Electra Assassin. That book is fantastic to me. I love her introduction in uh, in Man Without Fear. I think it's a great relationship the two of them build up. And absolutely the element of her leading Matt astray. Um, and eventually Fog- Foggy is the one that calls it out in the in the comics. Uh, he's the one that, that is telling him, is telling Matt that she's leading him astray. It's not needed in this. I like that they make it Matt's choice. I like that it's he's the one that sees how badly she's leading him astray uh, in this version. So, um, yeah, really, really good. Yeah, you can understand why Matt would fall for her. Or the Matt Certainly. back then, so the Matt we were introduced to back in college and the Matt he is now, and you can see where that path was taking him and why he diverted. And then you actually now understand like this is like proto man in black. Like this is yeah. the the man who, who obviously can fight. He obviously hadn't been up to that point. And then he see like he his moral compass was cemented probably in this flashback. Yeah, yeah. But uh, overall, look, I, I think Electra's origin in the comics has kind of been skewed quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, depending on which arc you're reading, which series. Remember, she was a scroll during the Secret Invasion. But I think, I, I, I'm so happy they kind of went with Miller and Ramita's um, kind of that origin, the Mammoth of Fear origin. Like, yeah. met her in college, he was impressionable. Like, I I did like the cocky Charlie Cox at the bar, trying to chat mm-hmm. her up, and then she just destroys him. And then you can Absolutely. see the... Yeah. Again, this is Charlie Cox, why I actually really like him. And I want to see him... I don't want to see him go to something else, because we lose, might lose him as Daredevil, but I want to see him in <laughs> other roles as well, because I think he could handle that quite interesting... You can He plays emotions on his face quite well, in terms of you can see the confusion, the, the cogs turning as she kind of is destroying him, and then he flips it back on her. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And a fundamental part of, of Matt Murdock's character really is that he's able to twist anything to his advantage because of his negotiation skills. It's one of his other little superpowers, I suppose. So uh, <laughs> so seeing that that way of being, he is a lawyer, remember? So he is able to talk people around to his way of thinking, which I, I love in that scene as well. Really, really good. Uh, John, do you want to give us your first point? Um, yeah, no, it, it's it's very similar to, to Chris's, um, that whole Electra and Matt um, and there's a few things that I love the I love the champagne and whiskey part where Electra's the champagne and Matt's the whiskey whiskey watch mm-hmm. McAllen twelve year old malt mm-hmm. um, there uh, and I like the fact that she does take a sip of whiskey I think from a decanter at a at uh, Roxon's uh, boardroom um, if only all boardroom meetings involved whiskey it would probably make them go uh, a bit smoother <laughs> uh, but I really. I liked how at the start there was this idea, and it goes back to what Chris said about where Matt 
finally realizes that you know she isn't necessarily the person for him you know confronted with the 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 possibility of killing his dad's murderer um, and and taking him out mm-hmm. and i love that at the start that that high society party and you know she kind of keeps him back and says that he's with me and then um there's almost that element of a kindred spirit there you know it's the fact that both of them have this uh, love of boxing, of uh, that kind of thing, have got those heightened senses. However, at that moment in time, he doesn't realize quite how deep and dark hers goes until in uh, Roscoe's uh, mansion uh, and being given that offer to, to, you know, to 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 kill him. Um, and I just thought that was a really nice progression all the way through. Though this this past between the two of them, and um, I think it really kind of was a great different departure given that we just had the punisher sort of initial arc of it with so much violence and so on that this was kind of a violent love story uh also being played out against a new blossoming romance with regards to karen and matt Mm -hmm. Um, and i think really you know we we find out that they both have very different ideas of what fun ultimately is Um, and you know matt in the present then with all of this memory going on is like, you know, you don't know me anymore, not ever again. I mean, debt really harsh. Absolutely. Um, I just thought that was really, really good. And I think you mentioned the, the bar, yep. uh, the conversation at the bar where, um, I think is it electric goes, you're pretty, but you're dumb. You only lost, you lost before you even got to the plate. Um, you know, she's there very successful. And then he's kind of like, you're bored. Um, that daddy's money can't buy you what you want. Uh, which is the unexpected. She likes that thrill of the high speed car, mm-hmm. the, the public, um, sex, the ultimately the breaking and entering and, and possibly the killing so you know she's a a psychopath yeah Um, i really like that and i love that as you say that it's matt's choice to say no i don't want to do that and it's the start of his moral code and compass yeah stuff it's really cool absolutely i also like in that interesting that she she tells him he also can make that blind thing work for him as well (laughs) which i thought was quite good (laughs) i love the interplay between these two honestly the the intro that we got to electra last week where she just says hello matthew in her a really alluring accent uh, was was fantastic just in itself to set up this character as to why Matt would have been interested in, interested in her. You know, he's supposed to be what in his twenties, uh, just around college age, um, and he, this is a very attractive, uh, very rich exotic woman uh that's fallen into his life you know yeah. um she is going to be hugely attracted to him and i like how they played it definitely definitely really cool so then derek what's your uh first point for my first point i'm going to take off the lead from the lead on from the last arc really i suppose we talked about the end of the punisher arc being in uh in the last episode uh what we have here is karen taking up the mantle and taking up the investigation of uh of the punisher i really liked it because we've now got the reason behind what happened to Frank Castle and why he is uh, targeting the gangs of New York. I thought this was a really good way to play it. Um, we had the huge monologue all the way in, uh, all the way through episode four, where um, where Frank told the reason why he's so angry and and the reason why he's, I suppose, uh, the fact that he's lost his family. Um, whereas now from Karen, what we hear is the reason why he's targeting the gangs, which is that they were having a gang war in a playground right beside where his kids were playing and they and his family died in that gang war. Uh, I like that it's played out this way and I like that yeah. it's Karen that finds out the story. Um I think it's a really good way to play it again. It's it's another another element of their of the the choice within this show to tell not show, which is uh, what we talked about last week, that it's uh, that it's a different way of, of doing things within this episode. You don't have to show every single thing. You can also tell the story and allow the audience to pick up on it, which I think is a really good choice. I love the fact that she's been kind of in amongst the archives all day mm-hmm. um, and she can't really find an obituary because she's looking for the obituary, not yeah. for the 
the the talk about gang warfare so I, I really like that play and i like the fact that that editor the same one from season one and obviously with the fallout from uh ben Ulrich's uh murder and that yeah and, and his kind of um guilt at, at having treated him the way he is but there's a, a nice little reminiscence about uh, ben Ulrich, which i thought was really nice yeah absolutely yeah no completely um i think it was allison that was the name of the reporter that's right, yeah. Like, this, I'm assuming, is not the end of the Punishers. Kind of like, they're just going to drag him out in the back. This is the subplot now? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. When I I, I meant initial Punisher arc. Yeah, no, and I think that's the thing. Like, I think now we're going to get, I think we discussed it in the last podcast, is like, we're going to get three <laughs> kind of arcs and then a final. So we'll get, like, four episodes Punisher, four episodes of Electra, four episodes of or two episodes of kind of filler, and then three episodes of finale. Like, we're going to end up getting these filler woods in between somewhere, people. Come on. I, I love that a, a lot of our audience have now watched all the episodes of Daredevil, and I love when they hear us say things like that, where we, we say something like episode eight and nine are going to be filler, and they go, no, those are the best ones. That's where something <laughs> huge happens. <laughs> yeah, well, look, damn. I, I need to go into the future where I've seen yes. them all come back and tell myself so I don't get this. That'll be our that'll be our post podcast review. Don't worry, Chris. You'll have the opportunity. Don't worry. <laughs> um, one thing, like one thing, I I did like is that they okay. So if we take say the theme of the first four episodes was kind of rage and adrenaline and punisher, like punishment. If what I'm getting from this is kind of this is going to be like manipulation, kind of icy, cold, motionless. So we're gonna plus ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be a different and I I I think I'm a, I'm kind of imagining or kind of putting my own thoughts onto this but was there slightly different lighting in this ep- in this episode versus the previous so whereas the first four were very dark kind of like subdued now and kind of like with a kind of um, almost a kind of a black gray haze this one right. has started to there's more kind of obviously red and it's kind of slightly brighter. We didn't have arcs in the first season. The whole season was tight pretty much that uh, around the building and the, the destruction of kind of the birth of Daredevil, birth of Kingpin. This mm-hmm. is the, these are like four issue runs. Yeah. Like with a, yeah. with an overarching kind of thread at the top. So it's very yeah. comic book styled. And where Absolutely. you're going to get these different types of emotions and themes and kind of pieces. But I think you're right. I think it's good that they didn't just do typically what another, any other TV show would have, could have done. It's like, okay, we'll put one reference into Punisher. So you know he's in the background, but we'll just focus on this. Like mm-hmm. they gave it a substantial chunk. Absolutely. And it's a substantial chunk given to Karen to make her again, keep her involved in the storyline. She's the one that brings the investigation that she has. She's the one that brings it to Matt and to Foggy. Foggy's telling her to give up on it. Matt's just telling her to be safe effectively, but she's yeah. still going to go and investigate it. And I think in a better way than she would have in season one, uh, she was kind of breaking down doors and doing some silly things in season one that got a few people killed. Yeah, she broke into the apartment. If, at yeah. least, at least in this episode, she's going to talk to the editor at the New York Bullet okay. to see if there's any information that he can help her with. At least it's something. Um, I still had, I still had in my notes, is this the return of Karen's bad habits okay. in the sense that I did destructive question mark because she's told by Foggy and Matt to leave it alone. And yet then she pursues it again. But I, I think there's something that makes sense here now because she's been at a law firm. Whereas I think in the past, this seemed to be like her own personal thing. This, this seems to be tied better to mm-hmm. the story um i think in season one as people who had listened to the podcast would remember um certainly i was one of the people that just found her motives a bit um hard to fathom um and we wondered whether it was you know going to be karen page's destructive side coming out and of course we never really saw that but she destroyed other people's but um lives by effectively not listening to people it mm-hmm. seemed really odd and i at, at this moment where she goes to the paper to look through the archives she is actually again going against what matt and uh foggy have oh, told yeah. her to do which is leave this alone um so 
I, I found that interesting, but it made more sense in this mm-hmm. to me because of her involvement at Nelson and Murdoch's and, um, and just, she seemed more integral to that setup than she did in season one. Mm-hmm. And I, I, it, I think it makes more sense yeah. from what's happening. But still, I wondered, is this a destructive side of Karen? Mm-hmm. Which we know from the comics she has. Yeah, quite possibly. Quite possibly. There's a couple of other uh, instances of that in, in this episode. But I do like how it's drawn out some of the extra detail about, about Frank Castle again. The idea that possibly he was black ops, um, po- that his record has been expunged about about him actually being in the army. Uh, but she, the only reason that Karen knows about it is because, as you say, she broke into the house, saw the actual medal, saw him getting the photograph where he's given it by a high ranking person. I think does, does she say the president, or do, or is it um, that she's just he's standing with a uh, pol- political leader? Uh, getting that, getting that, uh, getting the medal. So, um, by her knowing all of this information and tying it together, we have a little bit of the investigative side of the of the storyline coming out. So, I did like it, I must say, and, and, and finding it out through Karen is a, is, a, is definitely a good choice for the episode. I'm now more curious, is because all of season one we were like, where are they taking Karen's story? Are they going to make it mm-hmm. her own character, like an MCU version, or are they going down the comic book route <laughs> that we love? And now my question is we're going to get this love triangle between Marin and Electra and I'm bringing Marin back this is becoming a thing hashtag Marin <laughs> hashtag right. Marin and I think could that be the beginning of this destructive piece in that mm-hmm. okay so they're not going to let her find out Daredevil's identity probably till the end of the season where Matt's already screwed things up because he slept with Electra or something blah 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 and destroyed their relationship and she now knows and she does she has a vendetta against Matt now. I'm just really interested now. This is the thing. Also, she she's back alluding to a really bad previous life in, over Absolutely. the last course of episodes, including this one again. And I'm like, yeah. they're going to have to start delving into that further. Otherwise, mm-hmm. it's just going to be like nerds like us. And I'm using nerds as a, in a, a lovely sense of the word because I enjoy that term. I am a nerd about comic books. It's mm-hmm. a good thing. Um, but like other people are kind of like, they're glancing kind of com- off the cuff comments. Whereas for us, it's like, oh, come on. Just get like. Yeah, just take drugs, will you, Karen? And, and like fall apart. <laughs> yes, exactly. I just like, I'm I like, know. where is this going? Give me the come next on, Madam piece. Gow. Madam Gow. Fe- yeah. Fees are a cocaine cake. Or something <laughs> like that. You know, she, she needs to come off the rails. Exactly. Because that will just drive just dramatic craziness from Matt Murdock. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There is a great allusion to it in this episode during the uh, during the second part of their date, uh, where Matt's talking to her about why he lives in New York and what he loves about the city and the fact that it keeps opening up up itself to you. And um, there's so much more going on, and it is a city full of millions and millions of people. And then she says, "Well, I came from a town of very of a very small population, two or three hundred, I think." She says, and Matt goes, "Oh, is that why you came to the city?" And she just says, "No." So again, another ca- character questioning straight out why Karen's in the city. And again, no answer from Karen. Just, nope, <laughs> that's not the reason. So uh, I like that there's still this kind of build up. We'll get more. We'll get definitely get more as the as the season goes on. Uh, Chris, do you want to crack on with your next point? Yeah. So far, or this episode, it's done a really good job of not over-sexualizing Electra. Like, mm-hmm. kind of like didn't put her in just the red body leotard like that most people expected um even towards the end of the episode um like she was just in she was in a kind of a, a kind of dressing gown and when there was just off slowly as she walked off camera she slid down and you just saw her in a vest and underwear and that's great mm-hmm. because they could have gone the very stereotypical hey, kind of here she is in her underwear look oogle her oogle her men but they haven't, and it's great because it, it doesn't sacrifice the seductive elements of yeah. her. But my God, how awkward and cringeworthy was that bloody sex scene in Fogwell's gym? No, it was a great build-up in terms mm-hmm. of the, 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 the kind of reveal of his kind of senses and stuff. Yeah, that was cool. But but that that was like something out of like 1990s 
kind of like basic instinct type filmography kind of like oh, i loved it really i just it was yeah so I, I was just hoping i just hope they disinfected the ring oh my god <laughs> like how to get her hepatitis yeah like there's gonna be blood uh-huh. sweat tears everything on that floor absolutely. and they're having sex on it yeah kids always disinfect the ring after sex <laughs> yeah absolutely um, but it was just i don't know it was kind of it was like the, if they even did the kind of cliche about holding the hands as they kind of climaxed and the two of them squeezing fists together. Well, they did do one worse, and it's the one thing that stood out for me th- from for me from that sex scene. One worse than that, not not holding hands. It is Matt's hand around her throat at what the, the end hell? of the sex scene. Yeah. So that that I think is obviously there's a flashback. It's Matt's memory of the situation. I don't know whether that's just supposed to allude to the fact that he's already seeing a bit of a there's a bit of a dark side in him, uh, and that's what she's attracted to. I think there's a little bit of a touch of that. Yeah, uh, but it definitely stood out to me at the end of that. Scene. But it also looked like the hand in terms of the group as yes. well, like just the way okay. his hand was positioned around her neck, as though it was almost like uh, some kind of neck bracelet that sort of symbolizes obviously uh, the hand yeah. as well. If I can actually come to my next point mm-hmm. because actually it's it's the two break-ins of which Fogwells is one of them. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, like we have kind of talked about them but I I love these two break-ins because you have with Fogwells this realization that they both have this um physicality about them in terms of both fighting but also a physical attraction to one another and um, i really liked the the visual of the yellow tinted uh windows and the light behind them and you just see her dark shadow walking in front again i know i've alluded to daredevil yellow again mm-hmm. but it, it felt very reminiscent of that graphic novel i love the the sparring that they did and then obviously the um the the kinky kind of violent sex and of course um tied up in ropes um potentially links to uh the title of uh this episode of daredevil um in terms of kimbaku which is the japanese style of uh bondage or or bdsm um so like that was kind of interesting and, and that would fit with i suspect with electra given um her penchant for darkness and i think as well she alludes then in the second break in the 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 saucy son and corner corner uh part where she's eating cheese off his <laughs> Stop. off his marvel abs um, <laughs> you see it's like uh, luke cage with with the, the with the angle grinder on his abs yep. this one it's like his abs are so hard that she can cut cheese off, <laughs> off mm-hmm. um but i i love the fact then that again it, it's this kind of sexual build-up to revealing Roscoe, where they're chucking the glasses and, you know, she's onto the floor, she's teasing him um, and then you just have the brutal beatdown. I mean, that was, in a sense, again, reminiscent of the title uh, as well, Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, you had the hand around the throat and then you had this this bound and tied um, uh, figure of Roscoe being beaten. And I mean, you know, this Kimbaku is, it is being bound tightly, literally. It's this, um, it is an extension of techniques used to restrain prisoners. And, um, it is also then in, in sort of looking up this stuff, um, obviously, I hasten to add, um, Google image search. Uh, yeah. That, uh, <laughs> you know, as well, not only is the literal sense to bind tightly, but it is also in another sense within bondage, the exchange between two people describing the person who's doing the tying up and the person who's being tied up and bound. Right. So this was all within these two breakings. And I, I kind of really liked yeah. that, actually. I thought it was kind of, it linked to the title. It just, it showed this darkness of both of them. But then you have, as Chris said earlier, Matt walks away from it. Yeah. He he, and he recognizes that darkness within in him, and that's why he's always guilty. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's just a really nice kind of extension of all that. I thought I, absolutely. Yeah. I really agree with you. Like the the second break in that that foreplay part was brilliant, and the foreplay in Fogwells was brilliant. It was just that one sex scene for me was giggle inducing. It was just. Right. Like, I was like, oh, no, like, we got something so much better 
because this is a Marvel Netflix project, like this is the the max version of our, our MCU. I was expecting mm-hmm. the Jessica Jones type style uh, of uh, romantic encounters, like the the angle grinder to the abs, the breaking of bed. We've seen it. Like they mm-hmm. they can do it, but this was just for whatever reason. Like either this is going to end up being that. This obviously is his flashback, so it's how he viewed it in his eyes, and then we get a flashback through her eyes and something completely different. Like, that could be an interesting play on it. But I think in a boxing arena, there's no bed sheets to pull up to hide the, um, you know, I mean, like, I can understand why they would make the choice to, to pan down and just show her back and mm-hmm. her arms outstretched and then go to her front and, and show the hand coming up around the throat because, with the Jessica Jones scene, it was, well, there's the bed sheets. So it, it's not a full on naked yeah. sex scene. So the, 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 they're doing it slightly differently because of the environment in which it is. And I mean, if the two of them were able to break a boxing ring, um, then that is pretty violent. That's pretty strong. That's yeah. pretty strong. Okay. So let me withhold judgment until sex scene part two, and then I'll come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be over the dead corpses of the accuser. Oh. <laughs> oh, ju- <laughs> judging by the, the way things are elevating, preference. yeah. So, Derek, what's your next point? I think this is one of the episodes that had the most Marvel Universe connections in it, uh, and I'm going to rob them all. Oh, no, um, damn you! <laughs> well, firstly, because we get our first huge reference to Roxxon. Roxxon is, is something we've talked about on pretty much every single show that we've covered, every movie that we've covered. Roxxon have had a connection in there. Um, we didn't see much of Roxxon in season one. I think there was just the reference to the van in the first episode and a small reference to them otherwise. Um, but in this episode, we see that uh, this is who Electra Nachos is going to be working with or for is Roxanne. She's going to go in and, and infiltrate them, uh, which is which is really cool to have this organization still in existence all the way back from, as we saw in all the way through our Asian Carter coverage, uh, all and the way through the forties. Yeah, so. and there we have another strong woman breaking and entering into Roxxon. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, we also have a couple of little Jessica Jones references, which were great in here. We have uh, have the return of Marcy, uh, which is uh, Foggy's girlfriend, I suppose, who hasn't called her for months, but she references the fact that she's now working at HC and B, which is Hogart Chow and Benowitz, uh, Jerry Hogart's lawyer agency. Uh, and she also references the fact that the mayor's office are cracking down on vigilantes and have taken down one of the vigilantes who worked with HC and B, and that is one Jessica Jones. So one of the cool parts about this is we've now got a timeline for Daredevil season two, and it takes place right at the end of Jessica Jones season one, um, because at the time she is being interviewed by uh, the DA in the final episode of Jessica Jones. She's being interviewed by the DA about her activities, about her being a vigilante in the city. So uh, what this is setting up is the fact that um, from now onwards, I think we're going to be just after the end of season one of Jessica Jones. uh, But from here before the first five episodes take place simultaneously with with JJ, which I think is quite cool to have that established timeline now. Those are the little ones that I saw within the episode. Any others that I missed? Yeah, there was a few, and I agree. This was MCU laden. It was fantastic. Just on Roxxon, um, you're right. Roxxon, we've been told everything. They've been Jessica Jones. They've been in like every one of the the actual films, like the Avengers, the Age of Ultron. I'm assuming they're going to be in Civil War somehow. Mm-hmm. But the fact that the Sano Robotics is the Japanese arm of Roxxon yeah. is something completely new. Now, I think this is an MCU spin um, mm-hmm. because I'm not quite, yes. wasn't aware of this, but this is actually the second time Sano Robotics is mentioned. Do you remember the, the crate that, that had the weird child in it in the mm-hmm. first one? He was... Black Sky. Yeah, Black Sky. So that was the Sano Robotics um, kind of logo on the side of it. So this right. is the second time we've got it. Mm-hmm. The big unsolved or unexplored mystery from season one of Daredevil, yeah. actually, yeah, yeah. So what I find is interesting now is that so if Asano Robotics is the Japanese arm of Roxxon, right, and um, Roxxon, uh, so Electra and Matt kind of did their bit in Roxxon, and now at the end of this episode, we're assuming a large group of ninjas are about to storm in, and mm-hmm. they, these are ninjas are most likely the Hand. Does that mean that the front for the Hand is Asano Robotics and Roxxon? So that actually Roxxon isn't anyway connected to Hydra that we're aware of. It's actually the hand. 
very possible. So I don't very know possible. Really, yeah, yeah. I like that one. It's all connected to rock songs. Yeah, it's all rock songs. <laughs> Do you remember how I mentioned Electra's first appearance in Daredevil mm-hmm. issue 168 by Frank Miller? That was also the same appearance of Grotto. Right, very Rest cool. in peace. Okay. Yeah, there rest in go. peace. No team up with Grotto. That's, mm. I'm, I found that was funny because I, I never connected mm-hmm. this and yeah. I wasn't going to take the JJ reference because that was way too easy. She actually mm-hmm. said the name. Come on, man. Yep. Put a bit of work into it. <laughs> I got, I got <laughs> HCNB. True, you did. Okay, I'll give you that. Um, the final one I got is when Karen's in the bulletin's office. Do you mm-hmm. see the framed headlines across the wall? Yes. Yeah. So we got yeah. Battle of New York. So obviously the Avengers. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And there was the Stark Tower one. Yeah. Um, but then did you see Cybertech Settles? No. Yes. Do you remember... Agents of Shield, mm-hmm. Cybertech, oh, with Deathlock. Yes. yes, yes. There you go. So that's just like another cool. reference to Agents of Shield. I think we're getting closer to old Coulson coming in. Into the, I think we might be. Yeah, because they're just come on. They're they're like throwing them in now. Mm-hmm. So that would be cool. What I'm expecting is towards the end of this season, we'll get some type of mention of fish oil type um, destruction, kind of like pollution, kind of mm-hmm. infections. Uh, which will allude to the Inhumans arc that's going on at the moment in Age of the Shield. So then that will tie everything towards the end of this season, just before Civil War. Yeah, it would be be very cool to at least tie in the the timelines of the shows as well, because we're, again, unsure of the timelines of these and the movies. I'm not entirely sure that is going to happen. It would be cool if it did. I, I'm not entirely sure. I think I think they might allude to those things in little Easter eggs like that, mm-hmm. um, or like they did in season one, where they talk about you know the property being built up again and, and um, Kingpin being involved in that based on the Avengers. I reckon they'll do things like that, but I think this is generation its own. Oh, absolutely. No, but I mean, more so, like, you know, we've, we've, we were talking about this with Agent Carter mm-hmm. as well, where, you know, you've got the black goo. It looked very similar to Agents of Shield and it never played out. And I don't know whether, because it's a Marvel Netflix, um, driven show, it's not that they're not going to reference it. I get that, but I yeah. still don't think that, um, it's going to be that explicit. Yeah, it's think- going to bring in Agents of Shield. I would actually love it too, um, but it's in the same way that I would have loved the black space goo from Agent Carter to have been something linking to Agents of Shield mm-hmm. with Grant Ward, um, and that never actually happened. And and so I wonder, but it would be cool if it did. Definitely, it's certainly never happened in Agent Carter. But I don't. I still hold out hope that we'll see. A connection brought into Agents of Shield, definitely, and I think to to the point about that Chris made about the about the the fish goo connecting to the Inhumans. I think if that's if that's also a headline that's in the New York Bulletin office, I think that's probably enough as well for me, just to kind of set the timeline. It's about all I but about all I want. I don't know whether we're ever going to get Colson actually crossing over. Although Clark Gregg has definitely said that he needs to meet Iron Fist at some point. So potentially down the line in yeah, the future maybe. of the Defenders, we will have a Coulson appearance. And I think it will probably be an Iron Fist just because Clark Gregg centers this universe for the TV shows and he wants to be on that show. So I just think from my side, it's that they need, remember the way we had Nick Fury in the lead up to mm-hmm. the Avengers. He was always kind of in the post credit scene. It was that one person connecting it all. Yeah. We kind of need that now. Like, I think we need that for the person who's not like us, kind of looking for the Easter eggs and connecting the the headlines and stuff. We need Mm -hmm. a very blunt, in your face, this is the same universe. Like, like, okay, referencing the Kingpin and like the the, the Battle of New York and all that is great. But I, Mm -hmm. like, my partner was sitting on the couch and did not recognize it because I squealed. Like, I was like, ooh, look at that. Like, she didn't notice a thing. Yeah, but so yeah. they need something more that's kind of like a Nick Fury type intro. But but there's Jessica Jones. I mean, they mentioned that in this episode. Like in terms of these Marvel Netflix shows, they are all interconnected, and yes. they're connecting them through things like the newspaper articles or the mention of maybe wider MCU. As I say, 
I would love to see that. And may, maybe Black Sky will be connected with Inhumans in some way, or whether it's something completely different linked into Iron Fist. But I would think it would be more likely that they would be actually connecting it to Luke Cage mm-hmm. or something different rather than outside of their own street level heroes. I mean, even like in Jessica Jones, we have Night Nurse talking about, well, this isn't the first person that I've come across. Okay. You know, so the subtle ones, there's more blatant ones. Like- Absolutely. And speaking of blunt, the you've got your blunt New Yorker who is Night Nurse, effectively. She is your blunt New Yorker that's connecting all these characters together. She will, we know for a fact she's in uh, Luke Cage and has a bigger role than she had in Jessica Jones. Very likely if she's in Luke Cage, she's going to be in Iron Fist and she's going to be around for Defenders. So is the big is the big connection effectively that she gets kidnapped at the start of Defenders and all these people that she's helped out throughout their series come together to to take down whoever it is that kidnapped her? Is it just as simple as that? Is that what you need for a street level group to get together? Um, but I don't think we're ever going to get a huge crossover episode like we thought we would in season one of Daredevil when this whole wonderful set of shows started. I don't think we're ever going to get our big crossover between Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and that universe because it's not the same universe quick question black sky is not an inhuman is he we don't know we don't. but we don't know he could be he was so it, he was a child he's now dead at the hands of at the hands of stick in yeah. season one that's all we know about black sky from season one because remember with stick as well we did have that fairly mystical element with the guy with the incense or the mm-hmm. the joysticks burning Stones. At, at stone yeah yeah absolutely so there's still all that and i, I do i wonder whether it will go you know, obviously we're going to get the hand here. So, mm-hmm. and when the two of them get together, they're going to break some bones, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, looking forward yeah. to that. I think. Look, so we can kind of wrap this this point. Kind of, I I just think I agree for the Netflix universe. They're connecting that perfectly. That's the way mm-hmm. if, we, if we want to call it a microverse or a sub universe, right? Just of the Netflix show, couple of streets, really. Okay, yeah, the the Hell's <laughs> Kitchen universe. Um. They, they're connecting that perfectly because they have the characters and the mentions and so people will get that. What I think it just needs is, and this, this probably will might not even happen to the end of Defenders, is mm-hmm. just you need a walk on from the likes of some big character who people would understand from Benedict Cumberbatch, mm-hmm. from the, the kind of... Nick, if Nick Fury, kind of Samuel Jackson, or even the Coulson, just someone very brief, just to kind of, for the person who's not as, as, who delves as deep into this as well, it's just it kind of goes, oh, so this is actually happening. It's the same thing when I go watch Civil War in a couple of weeks. Just that Mm -hmm. kind of bit more anchor tight. And I think that's, that's all I think they need. Just one or two small anchors that just then kind of ties it in. Makes everyone go okay. It's everything's connected. Yeah, wasn't that the reason why Benedict Cumberbatch was in New York? We start that rumor right now. Yes, let's say that. There we go. <laughs> that, yeah. that he that he just had that one line that he says to Matt Murdock. You can use my place anytime, and opens up the doors of the Sanctum Sanctorum to to Matt Murdock. There, there you, you go. go. Exactly. And that's it. I, I I heard that from a reliable source. Yes. <laughs> uh, John, do you want to give us your next point? I do. Um, I really liked um, the expansion of uh, the DA Reyes, uh, her motives mm-hmm. from this, um, and how it obviously links in with Karen pursuing the the Punisher narrative, and and actually the the lack of a narrative that's been put out by not only the DA's office but also the press. Um, that you know, there's nothing mentioned about his army past or his family being wiped out, or even that he had a family. Yeah. Um, or even, um, you know, the holes in the story, including, uh, you know, the lack of any acknowledgement of the hole in the head. Um, like, I really like that. And I, I love the fact that linking to Jessica Jones with the DA's office is looking to build a platform for Reyes um, to become the mayor of New York mm-hmm. on the basis of taking down the Punisher and building a conviction against him. And that they've even got, obviously, with what happened in Jessica Jones, the fact that she was there questioning Jessica Jones with uh, Hogarth there at, towards the end of um uh the first season mm-hmm. that they've got her eye on that and this is all leading to Reyes 
um, sort of pitch to become the mayor of New York and how that may potentially link in with the, the suits that were mentioned previously um, surrounding the Punisher. There feels as though there's some complicity there between the DA's office and whatever happened to the Punisher. Yeah. And that those doors are going to get blown sort of wide open uh, and maybe we see then the development of, of uh, sort of Foggy or Blake going towards the, the DA uh, post, uh, I think, as I've mentioned previously. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I wonder if that's one of the cases. But I, I did really like this expansion of her motives uh, as the DA. Uh, there's a little you know subplot going on, though, which I'm kind of intrigued to, to find out about, whether it might interlink a bit more with uh, the Punisher's backstory as well. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of like that sort of... Um, nod here in this episode absolutely yeah yeah d- definitely really enjoyed that that building out of reyes's character now that we've seen her now in two series even though it was only one scene in jessica jones but uh but yeah just to that point part of my next point really was just about blake tower versus foggy nelson you know uh, you'd mentioned last week in in your points about uh about the fact that they are referenced in the comic books they're they're both quite big characters in the comic books and that foggy had tried to become the da at a point and blake tower was his arrival in that uh in that uh in that fight for the da's office so really good to have these two characters have a scene together where you've got foggy um telling him no telling him that he'd be hugely cooperative if he followed the law because that's the way that's what foggy does i <laughs> love that love the scene love the foggy shoots him down i love how, uh, how show me a subpoena mm-hmm. yeah I'll, I'll i'll do it for you just show me a subpoena yeah i i thought it would agree i think reyes is kind of I think Reyes, they're building Reyes as a kind of anti-vigilante type kind of person from just what mm-hmm. we're learning. Um, or pro-registration, as it might be called oh, soon. Oh, my oh, God. Yeah. See, yeah, everything's connected. Yeah, <laughs> that would be very cool, actually, mm-hmm. yeah. Because I was just about to say that it re- that she's that General Ross type character, um, but f- from this world, that, and that would kind of link nicely into that registration mm-hmm. aspect as well. I, I, Yeah, I agree. I think, and that's... One of the reasons I really like that they've got Reyes in now and they're make they're building her as this the big bad for the law firm, if you want to put it mm-hmm. that way. So the, yeah. the, the the lawful big bad. Like right. 'cause everything she's doing is above the law. Mm-hmm. Like she's just withholding small bits of information. It's like she's playing the game very much. And that's yes. why I like that character. And I li- yeah. I I'm interested to see where they take this storyline because I think if you imagine the law firm as a kind of character, this is mm-hmm. this is the Daredevil's arch nemesis. This is the law firm's arch nemesis because everything that they do, they 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 fight for the little guy, and she's mm-hmm. doing this just to better herself. Yeah. And I, what I really want to see is if she takes down the 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 Nelson and Murdoch, like she rips them apart almost towards the end of the season. What I don't want is that this is a small, a small thread piece, if you know what I mean. Like yeah, just like yeah, connecting yeah. The, the two dots to two, two episodes. I want this to actually, I actually do want this to blossom. Like if they do a whole courtroom episode, I am, I'm in heaven, law and order, Nelson and Murdoch v. Reyes. Like I would yeah. watch that shit. Yeah. Like this is, could be good. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's it's one of it's one of the huge elements, obviously, about the comic books is that that he's a lawyer by day and and defender of Hell's Kitchen by night. So we haven't seen a huge amount of the lawyering. We saw one episode of it last season, uh, or one bit of it last season. Uh, I'm wondering if that's going to be Foggy's element of this of this season. You know that he is going to be taking on the on the DA. You know, and he's going to be trying to get Reyes now. We've already seen him versus Blake Tower now, so that that's kind of maybe be his his angle as Karen follows her angle on the Punisher to investigate and clear him, I suppose, of his uh, of his crimes by providing his backstory to to the police and to the, the people around. And then you have um obviously Matt working with Electra possibly, uh taking down the more evil, more um violent threats towards the city, and then they all culminate as the rest of the season goes on. Yeah, that would be good. I like I'd like that. I'd I'd, wa- I'd watch yeah. that show. <laughs> Absolutely, we will watch the show. We will podcast about it. <laughs> Single female lawyer, yeah. Foggy Nelson, <laughs> Foggy lawyer. Oh my god, that'd be an amazing theme tune. Foggy, Foggy Nelson. <laughs> you just see him running towards the course, like slow mo, like Baywatch. I'll be there forever. That's a copyright Single strike. Single male lawyer. <laughs> there you go. 
<laughs> Poor Foggy is single as well. I mean, I really liked how Foggy is so kind of tough here with Blake as well. I thought that was really cool. But Derek, what's your next point? My final point is really just a couple, just a little glimpse at the end of the episode of what we see at the end and how it's going to lead into next time's episode. It's made me 100% want to skip ahead. Uh, as most of our listeners know, I make the guys stop at the end oh, of this episode. My They're allowed, gosh. They're allowed to watch pearls. the episode as many times as they want to before we podcast. I'm going to uh, faint. But not allowed to move on. Uh, this, for the first time since, uh, since I think, one of the episodes of Jessica Jones, I think probably episode 11 or episode 10 of Jessica Jones, I... 100% was letting that countdown clock get as close to one before, uh, before, uh, before turning it off, um, to make my notes for the podcast. I've um, secretly watched all the episodes. <laughs> I, I go down at about three in the morning. I know you haven't because I, I, I can see. Damn you, Netflix and your data <laughs> tracking. <laughs> but the fact that we have effectively Electra presenting, uh, Daredevil with his Daredevil costume in, in her apartment, she's taken it from, um, from Matt's apartment without him knowing about it. I was wondering for parts of this episode why he wasn't dressed in his costume to uh, monitor uh, Electra when she was uh, in the offices of Roxxon, uh, that kind of stuff. It seemed a bit odd that he that he hadn't done any activity in the costume. But what we find out is actually, even if he'd gone looking for it, uh, Electra had already stolen it and brought it, brought it to her apartment mm. waiting for Matt, you know. Um, so she knows all about uh, Matt's real side um, she knows all about how to how to get him on her side. Uh, she knows all of his secrets. So not only was she uh, did she have a relationship with him years ago that broke up uh, after the incident with Roscoe, she also knows everything about him now and is very quick to bring it to bring it to him that uh, that she knows all about him. So um, thought it was a great ending to the to the episode. I wish we could have moved on, especially because we've seen part of the fight scene in uh, in one of the trailers in the past. Um, so I know the fight scene is going to be pretty cool to watch when we get to it next time. That's actually one of my final points too, um, but I'm taking it from a different tack. Okay. That was an annoying hell of a cliffhanger. Like, they showed it to us in the trailer. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Like, just that fade to black. I was like, no, no. This is the Netflix formula. Mm-hmm. Like, the cliffhanger in the hell that you was like, that countdown clock. So that you just go, oh, I really just want to see what happens when that guy with the silencer runs in. Yeah. Like, like I was just like, come on. That was not fair. Um, yeah, it's, so, it's so fair for normal Netflix users. It's yeah, so it's unfair for Derek. us. <laughs> it's not fair for anybody who podcasts with me, definitely. Uh, but that's my final point. Uh, Chris, do you, want to have, do you have a final point? Uh, actually, was my final point. Mm-hmm. As I kind of said, like that annoyed the hell out of me. That that kind of ending. Um, but I'm gonna I, I'm gonna take total blame for that. I'm not gonna put that on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, fine. I'm gonna blame you. But okay. like, it just that kind of I wanted a bit more payoff up front um, because because this episode focused more on the storytelling mm-hmm. and the, the kind of backstory. We did not get that much kind of action if you I don't want to even call it action mm. it was just a lot of kind of there was a lot of monologue there was a lot aside from the the kind of the, the second mansion scene with uh, the battling Jack's kind of uh, gunman or murderer like I, I kind of expected a bit more I understand why they did it but I just wanted that bit more climactic even if they cut mid fight scene mm-hmm. or like they kind of like electric tape jumps out and throws the bag at Matt and then he, while well, he's putting on his gear, she's battling two of them. Right. And then he finally pulls on the helmet and then it's, okay, now it's go time. That's a better ending. Mm-hmm. It's just like the, they could have given it a bit more, I don't know, a bit more oomph. I understand why they do. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I kind of thought it was cool that, you know, we know the Yakuza are coming up the the side of the the apartment block mm-hmm. um or the you know the skyscraper one of the things i was unsure about really was why matt had gone to her penthouse after going out uh with um with karen and um, that 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 didn't seem to have been fully explained i mean he's there asking about the roscoe incident so okay in terms of the flashback it makes sense but that's not actually happening in the present Mm. and so okay maybe it's his memories you know we've been saying it's what he's remembering about it so maybe that's ultimately why but I, i was wondering whether you know it was just the fact that you know he's building this relationship with karen but then an old flame 
an old flame that he doesn't necessarily want to speak to again um is back but then he goes up to her apartment you know that's mad yeah well no exactly <laughs> and I, I think that you know there is that sultriness about electra that despite what she's done in the past despite what her kind of her p- persuasion is with regards to this sort of nod to violence in a sense what does she call she goes there's this there's always been this glorious darkness in you mm-hmm. so they both do have that kindred spirit still even though matt does want to step back from from that and um, and maybe karen is that other side of him and i suppose that's just really segue into my final point which was i actually really loved uh matt and karen's date Mm -hmm. i loved the move from the expensive restaurant to kind of the local uh, asian restaurant i thought the 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 lights on the ceiling was like fantastic i was like if i opened a restaurant i would love to have all those coloured lights. And I just thought, like, there was such an awkwardness in the expensive restaurant. And then there was this relaxed conversation. And it was all about my city. It was, you know, they're, they're talking about the diversity and how great New York City is. It's just, I think, really, really nice. Yeah, it, 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 it frames is. the kiss really well. And I suppose it contrasts then with his... his um his relationship or or what follows next up in Electra's penthouse. Mm. So I, I, I kind of really like that. I also kind of like the transition from, you know, this expensive restaurant with the awkwardness. And, you know, they say, I've never been that comfortable with rich stuff um, to this sort of street style uh, restaurant. And then you have the transition from going from the side streets where this restaurant is, the relative quietness in the midst of Manhattan um, and Hell's Kitchen to suddenly coming out into the hustle and bustle of the city. And you suddenly get all these sirens, people sort of talking loudly, shouting. And there's this moment where he comes out of the side street uh, into this more kind of noisy atmosphere. Yeah. And I thought that was really... I just thought it was really cool. It was a really nice kind of visual in this episode. And uh, again, it tees up nicely Karen and, and uh, Matt's relationship, really. Yeah. Um, which was, was great. I've actually just remembered as well. Electra does call him whilst he's in the restaurant. Yes, she, so, yes, she does. So he, <laughs> she's on his mind, um, you know. So that's probably why he goes back there. Yeah. That's exactly why, yeah. Hooray! I figured it <laughs> You've out. Solved it. You've solved it. I've yeah. solved the massive mystery. Yeah, no, the, the date sequence is uh, really, really good. I really like the fact that they're that they're actually trying to take the opportunity to go on a date. And if you've ever gone on a date with a co-worker, what do you talk about for the first 10 minutes of it? It's all about work. Um, you know, how, how was your day? Well, you know because you were in the office with me uh, all day. Kind of thing. <laughs> uh, I thought that was quite fun. Uh, I love the, love the touch with Matt using his uh, his great charm of being a blind guy and using it to his advantage to Karen kind of going uh, where she says uh, I wish you could see the place and he says yeah. I can if you describe it to me that's really um, cool that was a nice it's line it's a great line yeah. and then as she describes it to him she goes this is sounding really cheesy but I promise it isn't <laughs> love that love that little moment where she's talking about all the lights overhead um, and some of them being peppers that are shaped like light bulbs and he's kind of looking at her yeah uh, like I love how it just contrasts the fact that he is um you know, he, he has the little kiss with her on, on the steps, mm-hmm. uh, and then he doesn't want to go upstairs and and spoil that moment. Yeah, uh, that he leaves it, and that's kind of in total contrast to obviously what we see at Fogwells mm-hmm. uh, with this sort of hot, passionate sort of monster that's going on in the middle of the the boxing ring. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I love it. Yeah, the, the, the lines that he says to her are really well written again uh, in this scene. He says, uh, I have an incredible ability to bring disaster to the things I love most. Um, if I leave it here, then I, have, then I have tomorrow to look forward to and then maybe the next day. And then Karen finishes it with, and the next day as well. So um, a nice little bit of the planning for the future. Again, showing the huge difference between Matt as a 20 year old and Matt as, you know, a mid 30s guy. Um, very, very different attitude, you know, uh, of, of those stages in life, you know, and obviously pursuing a bigger relationship here with Karen than he was with Electra, which was a, uh, a, a little boxing ring fling, uh, I suppose. That's it for points on the episode. Uh, I've just got one quick note because it's one of the other references I forgot. Uh, 
The fact that in the New York Bulletin, the editor tells them that the reason why they don't have a filing system is because during the incident, all of their computers were wiped. So again, a little reference to uh, to the New York incident. Well done on that one. I missed that. There you go. Any other notes? Anybody else? No, I don't think so. So with that, Chris, do you defend this episode of Daredevil? Episode Five, Kinbaku. Yes, the, uh, this episode was a real change of pace, especially after the Punisher mini arc. Mm-hmm. But if I focused on a new character, and so like I, it's understandable they changed the tone slightly, and as I said, they they replaced the rage and adrenaline with this kind of icy kind of manipulation style. Everything was cold, and it was a lot better. And it's the official introduction of Lecture. Yeah. Like, like, it was brilliant. Um, this is the second big get we've got after Punisher. And like the Punisher, they got her right of what we've seen so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They perfectly encapsulated this Miller-esque type, uh, John Romita Jr. type Electra mm-hmm. from the comic books from the kind of back in the day. But it was good. My fear was this kind of real, really bad take from the comic, a direct translation from the comics, mm-hmm. which probably wouldn't have worked. But they managed just to take, like... Using a fantastic actress, they've managed from just this episode to introduce a character who is huge in this lore, and in a way that doesn't make you go, oh, is that how they did that? Yeah, it's just, it'd be just like the Electra movie then. Oh, God, yeah. Oh. My only downside for this whole episode would really be the cringeworthy, in my opinion, <laughs> sex scene in the gym. Um, although there was uh, some other points there that was kind of... That were interesting um, from your side. The hand, is it, yeah, the hand. For me, it was just a bit too cringeworthy. And I've seen Marvel and Netflix do so much better mm. with sex scenes and the, the building the tension, which they did better two scenes later. Um, but no, uh, that was the only downside. So yes, I defend this episode. By sex scenes, you mean just Jessica and Luke Cage? Because literally, yes. there have been no others. <laughs> No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they could, did it so much better. So, John, do you defend this episode? I do defend this episode of, of Daredevil. Um, I will give this four and a half cheesy abs out of five. Um, <laughs> you know, I really like the change of pace in this episode. Um, I think it was initially I didn't quite know where it was going because of, you know, you, it, it's off the back of such... Um, a bloodthirsty, violent rawness of, of this initial arc of of Punisher uh, and and some of his backstory, and obviously reintroducing. You know, I mean, there was a fight in episodes um, between Daredevil and, and Punisher for the first three, and yeah. then obviously the big showdown with uh, Finn uh, in in those catacombs. So. This was a really nice change of pace. And I, I love the fact that it was centered around Matt Murdock and essentially his relationships mm-hmm. uh, with women, uh, with Electra and that initial kindred spirit sort of turning into a fairly uh, dramatic exposure of the, the level of the darkness within her uh, and Matt trying to sort of pull back from that. Then with the, the, the purer, uh, form that is Karen Page and, and how he's approaching that relationship because of obviously everything we see in this episode, uh, with Electra. Um, I think a bit like with you guys, um, you know, the fact that we knew what was about to happen, um, with the, the Yakuza coming up the, the, in the elevator and probably up the side of the building and um, that, you know, it would be nice just to have seen that in this episode. I mean, I know, you know, it's, Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, down to the the next episode. If you if you really want to do that, so I mean, technically, you could argue there isn't really a break. It's just how we're watching it. But mm-hmm. you know, it it would have just been quite nice, maybe even just to see them burst through or or see them doing that abseil up the building to get there. That would have been quite cool. Um, I loved in this episode. I loved the two break ins at Fogwell's gym at, at Roscoe's. And uh, I, I kind of just love that contrast between Electra and Matt with regards to uh, the whiskey and the champagne. I, I just thought that was really nice. And I, I thought it was nice how it seemed to link in, or at least I interpreted that uh, to the title of this episode in, in quite a nice uh, sort of smart way, really. Um, and then after that, 
you know, there were other little aspects that were, were flowing through this, such as uh, the DA's motives and, you know, Foggy maintaining his, his real sort of... Um, his, his savviness in, in the law arena. Um, I love the idea that's come out from, from the podcast as well, that maybe, you know, Reyes does become pro-registration and that that may lead into um, this uh, season of Daredevil or even beyond in one of the other Marvel Netflix shows. I think mm-hmm. that'd be really cool and a, a nice little consequence of Civil War. And um, so... All in all, absolutely defend this episode of Daredevil. And, and I mean, again, just seeing Karen doing her pursuit of Frank Castle's story what was kind of interesting to see. And I wonder, you know, will she become destructive uh, at some point in this season? Uh, she wasn't in season one and we thought she might do. Will she become destructive? Will it be Electra that pushes her over that edge? Uh, you know, because now... There are two women in Matt's life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would actually be really interesting. I wonder how that's going to play out. Absolutely. But Derek, do you defend this episode of Daredevil? I certainly defend this episode of Daredevil. Yeah, absolutely loved this one, this intro of uh, Electra, the flashbacks to young uh, young Matt and young Foggy. And Electra and Matt getting together, really enjoyed them. But you guys have talked about it. We've talked about it for uh, our, f- our five points Uh Nothing really more I can say about this episode. Really enjoyed it and can't wait to see how Elodie Young plays out uh, in this in the rest of this series. One of the really exciting things that we've talked about before is that she is a trained black belt in about three different martial arts. So uh, a lot of the coming up fight scenes are going to be done by Elodie Young. So I'm really looking forward to seeing her getting in with with full fists and feet flying uh, as we go into the rest of the season. Yeah, really enjoyable. Uh, with that, it's time to get on to some feedback. So our first piece of feedback comes from our friend Claire Laffer, um, who says, I love that flashback Matt also wears rectangle sunglasses. Uh, and David Wang points out that's the same as in last year's Nelson v. Murdoch. Hey. Uh, Ronaldo also got in contact with us. He says, uh, possibly the hammiest acting so far in the series goes to the waiter in the first scene, Matt and Foggy. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is working in the yeah. kitchen, so I guess you need some hammy acting in there. And that's your joke of the week. Oh, my God. <laughs> Ronaldo also says uh, Karen's choice of restaurant on her date with Matt is a highlight of cinematography beautiful vibrant colours give it such a romantic feel oh absolutely apparently that is a real restaurant in New York mm-hmm. that actually recently got closed down about a year or two ago and they and now unless they moved it from its original location mm-hmm. but I was reading somewhere that this was a beloved um, kind of date spot for many many people really um, and the 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 comments I was reading is everyone thought it closed down. So I think they may have actually rebuilt a restaurant or the, the, the decor of this well-known kind of uh, Manhattan Hell's Kitchen style uh, date spot. Interesting. Because they apparently... Not, so I was like, ooh. Not enough people fall in love in New York, obviously. <laughs> that must be it. <laughs> That's a quick 20, flat, 20 levels in an elevator and back down again. All right. We will have to, uh, we will have to look out for the next time we're in New York and see if, uh, see if we can find it. Ronaldo goes on with his thoughts, saying, uh, initially, it was a bit of a hard episode to settle into after the adrenaline of the Punisher arc, but the episode builds an interesting emotional side to Matt, Electra, and Karen in between all the investigating and Electra's unexpected arrival in Hell's Kitchen. Reintroducing Sweeney was a clever way to show both Electra's skewed way of showing her affection for Matt and Matt's revenge, but ultimate disdain of Electra's nature. Ooh. Mm. Yeah, pretty good points, Ronaldo. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm like, damn, can we just like record this episode? I take some of them. Just <laughs> Your points are good. Your points are good. Don't yeah. worry. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that feedback, Ronaldo. Um, Ronaldo, absolutely. Ronaldo, Claire, and David did leave their feedback over on our Facebook group. You can go and join that just by going to the facebook.com slash groups slash Defenders TV podcast. Uh, we also have a bit of feedback that came in through our email address, which is feedback at Defenders TV podcast. You can share any of your thoughts in over there. Uh, this feedback came, came in from Lieutenant Floby. Uh, really <laughs> sorry about this. I meant to get this in in last week's episode just to get the chance before the edit. But Lieutenant Floby says... Hi, guys. Love your podcasts. I have two comments for you. Uh, One, regarding Daredevil following the trail of the dog's blood, my take on that was slightly different. It seemed like he lost the scent of the dog's blood when the shopkeeper hosed down the sidewalk. However, he heard the police radio coming from a nearby building and used the sound to continue his tracking of the Punisher. Really good point. I have since watched back the episode. Totally right. That's exactly what happens. 
Daredevil does lose the trail of the dog's blood um, and then picks up the the uh, the sound coming from all the radios that are within Frank Castle's little hideout. Um, so I was wondering how he made that leap, how he was able to still continue on and follow the dog's blood, but he wasn't. He was following something else. Smart Daredevil there. Absolutely. And the second point from Floby is, as a longtime fan of the comic book, I'm so happy with the portrayal of Foggy. Foggy easily could have been the chubby, bumbling sidekick, but between the casting and writing, they have nailed the character. Foggy's the heart of Nelson and Murdoch and loyal to a fault. I'm just thrilled that they really understand Foggy. Keep up the great show, guys. Thanks, Floby. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I actually think he's being written so much better this season. Um that compared to the first season mm. um like he, he was still written well in the first season but it i don't know it it, it almost felt he was slightly peripheral um in the first season mm. when you compare the level of um storyline that he's getting and how integral it it was at least for the first four episodes um i i thought it was really good okay i know you know, characters move back and forth oh, between episodes, but I've really enjoyed Foggy um, much more uh, so far this season um, compared to first season. Not that I didn't like him in the first season. I just thought um, it ultimately did become about Kingpin and Daredevil. Certainly. I, I mean, it was a different story to tell. Um, but yeah, I, I think Foggy's uh, arc, and the same with Karen in in this season so far, from what I've seen, uh, for me it is really a lot better. Yeah, no, and I I'm in agreement as well. I think they've learned from last year, from the first season. Like they they listen to our podcast. <laughs> thank you, writers. We thank you for your patronage, and they they've taken some of those points where the characters they were there, they were. They were like 80% complete. Mm -hmm. And just because of the way that the, the pacing had to finish up and they had to finish, like, focus more and more on Matt and, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio as Wilson Fisk, they, they had to kind of put these characters a bit more sidelined. And now they, they kind of go, well, actually, now remember, like, they, they weren't supposed to get a second season. Mm -hmm. So now they've gone, okay, well, what stories can we tell? Wow, well, we've got these two characters that we haven't really fully, they hadn't fully, fully fleshed them out. Yeah, absolutely. Like a lot of, a lot of Foggy's character in the last season was just circling around Matt a lot. It was like, that's his best friend. He's the one that set yeah, up the law exactly. firm with him. He finds out about Matt being Daredevil. This season has, has had a lot more activity from uh, Foggy Nelson in the law firm being a lawyer, standing up to people around him, showing that he is a very strong character. And yeah, totally agree. Really enjoyed those elements of the yeah, character that definitely. he brought out. And the fact that he's no longer at, I suppose, at arm's length with Matt. So he knows all about Matt's uh, Matt's sideline, his other gig, I suppose. So uh, they're able to have a lot more interaction about about though that side of his life than they were able to in the first season as well. So there, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more foggy and, and totally agree with Floby here. There's, there's, uh, he is a great character and they've done a great job of creating him. Definitely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Thank you so much, Floby to Claire, David and Ronaldo for, for all the, the, the feedback and comments It's really appreciated. Thank you. And guys, yeah, no, completely agree. Thank you so much for your feedback. We want to hear it. You have a point, you have an opinion. We will read it out every Time we podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Especially if you differ and you spot any Easter eggs that we miss because it kills me every time. But at least I know then that other people are catching the ones I miss. Absolutely. Yeah. We've yeah. still got an Easter egg to get through, actually. <laughs> I, I'm not allowed Easter eggs this year. I got a Kinder Easter egg which had <gasps> Thor in it. Mm hmm. Oh my god! The Kinder egg was, of course, gorgeous, but um, you don't need quite as many different parts to put Thor together as you probably would have done in the eighties. No, probably not. <laughs> was it a giant Easter egg? Yeah, like, yeah. So it's a giant Big Thor. Kinder egg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my god! Well, where was that all my life? I know. I know. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, it was pretty cool. But on that note, I think it's time to end out the episode. It's been great having everybody back around the microphones for uh, for one episode. And hopefully we'll have it all again next episode, episode six of Daredevil Season 2. Yeah, and of course, remember, you can find us at defenderstvpodcast.com forward slash iTunes. Please subscribe to us there and, and review the show. Helps other people on iTunes find the show. And of course, um, if you're not an iTunes person, then of course you can find us in any Good or evil podcast, um, Player FM, Stitcher, um, Podcast Addict, or Beyond Pod. 
Uh, and again, subscribe to us there and our lovely tones will pop into your earlugs uh, every time we upload and publish one of our podcasts. And remember, we love you and we always want to hear your feedback and you are cool, but you will never be as cool as Benedict Cumberbatch in New York, dressed as Doctor Strange, buying Doctor Strange comics cool. <laughs> you may be cool, but we still want to hear from you because if you are Benedict Cumberbatch, dressed as Doctor Strange, emailing us, John may just die. <laughs> no, I would faint. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, it, with pleasure. And remember, we love you, but we don't Kimba cool love you. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye. This has been a Flickering Myth Podcast Network production. For more information, head over to flickeringmyth.com for more shows like it. Find this show in iTunes by searching for the podcast name and head over to youtube.com forward slash flickering myth to subscribe to the Flickering Myth movie show. We'll see you on the next podcast. Take care. Bye bye.